OG Ananobi. Now, OG Ananobi is going to be due for his deal. His his son, I mean, his his representation, Sam Rose, the son of, of Leon Rose, CAA thing. We, we get all of that. Now, here's Jake Fisher of Yahoo. He's reporting that um, it's not just a cut and dry thing here with, with Ananobi and the Knicks. You have teams like the Philadelphia 76ers who might be interested. What, what, do, what do you think just based on who you've spoken to and, and your gut? What does your gut tell you about OG? I think the 76ers will definitely be interested. I think it's him or Paul George mm. who are who are the guys. I couldn't tell you who's number one on the list. If I had to guess, I'm going to, you know what? I'm not going to guess because it's mm. going to get aggregated like the fart and then yeah. it's going to be all over and yeah. it's going to be Fred Katz reports. Paul George is signing with the 76ers. Yeah. And then that's going to be out there. So I'm not going to guess. But those are two guys who are very high on their list. I think the Knicks are the overwhelming favorites to bring him back. That is something where I would be shocked if he were not back. You make that trade because you know you will do whatever it takes to keep OG Ananobi. And you make that trade knowing that he could be very expensive. It's not like the Knicks made uh-huh. that trade and then they're like, oh, no, it's going to cost $38 million a year for Ananobi. Oh, no, it's uh-huh. going to cost forty in starting salary for Ananobi. Like, the Knicks did not make that trade thinking they no way. could get Ananobi for 28 mil, you know, if they can, I'm sure they'd be thrilled, but that's not going to be the highest offer for him. Mm. So I think he will take offers from other teams and I think he will end up back. And if he doesn't, it's because the Knicks somehow fumbled it in a way that I can't anticipate. And I imagine you can't anticipate right no. now. I would just, I would just be totally shocked if, and there's always there's time there's always time the stuff stuff can always happen over the next month or whatever but mm-hmm. just it would be really shocking if he didn't come back yeah I, I would be stunned I have to think that you know these guys were playing chess when they made this deal and that that they figure that a, a, a extension would be um, on the table and and that they would have the inside track there. I, I can't see him having that representation that he has, the connection to Leon Rose and World Wide West. Like, why would they give up quickly and RJ if um, there was even a chance that that he would walk out the door afterwards? And, you know, not knowing him, I mean, you, you've covered him in this half season that he's been there. OG kind of strikes me as a guy that may take a little less on a Brunson route. Maybe he sacrifices a bit for the betterment of the team. What, what does your gut tell you there? My gut always tells me that guys who haven't gotten their massive payday yet want to get their massive mm. payday. And mm. that maybe there are exceptions to that. Maybe Jalen Brunson is an exception to that. But look, like we think of Tim Duncan as the ultimate team guy. We think of Tim Duncan as the guy who took less to stay with the Spurs his whole career. Mm. But he did all of that after making the max for a gazillion years in a row. Yeah, right. You know, right. guys, guys who who take less are normally, and I know this runs counter to what I was just saying, mm-hmm. but I don't think Ananobi is also in that stratosphere of like, we're not talking about, I don't know, maybe maybe if we're talking about, maybe it depends on how we define less. Mm-hmm. Could he take $2 million a year less than in order to help the Knicks because they're that $2 million because of something they anticipate with their financials moving forward, mm-hmm. that $2 million actually keeps them you know, 500,000 under the second apron, according to their projections in 2025 or something like, Mm -hmm. sure, sure. But if we're talking about like really taking less in some sort of significant way, that's not a couple mil here or there. I just find that the guys like David West who opt out of 12 million to sign with the Spurs, the guys like Tim Duncan and Manu and Tony Parker who take less, maybe they just only do it with the Spurs. Yeah. You know, David West going David to West, Golden yeah, State. Big example. Like the 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 guys who take less in those scenarios tend to be guys who have gotten paid for their whole careers, and they're like, you know what, I'm ready. Who cares about this money? I want to go win. Mm. I want to go win a title. I've made all my money. It's it's not usually someone who's 26 years old has made very good money so far, but has not made close to the amount of money that he's sure. going to command. Like literally, his salary could more than double. Mm. That that is that is on the table. His salary could more than double year over year. And just normally you don't you don't see that. And the word was always that he wanted to get his contract, which I say with absolutely no negative tone at all, by the way, who in their right mind would not. It's his profession. True, true. Uh, so so I 
I imagine that the Knicks made that acquisition knowing that and a lot more about the details. Since, as you mentioned, like Sam Rose is actually not his primary guy. Okay. The way CAA works is the way CAA works is they have like one primary mm-hmm. on a guy. Uh, and then they have a couple of secondary agents mm-hmm. who kind of help out on the fringes. But like Sam Rose is not necessarily his like Sam Rose is Jalen Brunson's primary guy. Mm-hmm. Sophie Toppin's primary guy. Mm-hmm. He's actually not. OG Ananobis. It's a it's a it's a guy named Austin Brown who's mm. one of the highest the highest up agents at at CAA, and I think I think he's gonna get paid. I I think we're gonna look at the contract and be like, all right, that's yes, a, oh yes, a lot of money. Oh yes, that is that is a lot of money. Like yep. I think he is going to get paid. He fits a unique archetype. There are just very few. I, I understand the injury history and I understand the CAA relationship and everything like that, but there are just very few players in the NBA who can start on one through five, be really good on one through five and can hit threes and give 15 ish points. There are just like yeah. unbelievably few players in the NBA who fit this description. You can, you can count them on one hand and those guys get paid. That's why that Herb Jones deal is unbelievable for New Orleans. They mm. were capped out at how much they could pay him. Yeah. They could only give him like 56 million over four years. And that contract is unbelievable for them. That's one of the best contracts in the league because Herb Jones has this incredibly rare skill set that OG has. And I actually don't even think he's the offensive player that that OG is. So he, he's gonna get he's gonna get a lot of money. And now now here's the thing. You know, the thing that I've been concerned about is that the honeymoon was great this year. 26 and 5, his impact. Stevie Wonder could have seen it. Now comes the expectations because the Knicks fan is going to see. I think, I'm with you. I think it's going to be northwards of 30. North, probably 35 and up. It's going to be probably double, like you said. Now here comes the expectations because the Knicks fan is going to say, we're paying this guy 30 something million and he's not on the court. He's got a hamstring injury. Next year, it's going to be, you know, his big toes broken. He's out for a week or two. How, how, how do we justify that? Because some, some are saying, don't give him the money. I don't agree with that. I say you got you to gotta roll out the Brinks truck for his type of impact. But how, how does he navigate that next year? That's going to be interesting, man. I think you might be able to answer this better than me, but here's my take. In terms of fan reaction, if he plays 45 games in the regular season, but he's healthy come playoff time, and the Knicks make a crazy run because they're so good when he plays, no one's going to care. No one's going to sure. care that he missed Money that time. he missed 37 regular season games. Yeah. No one's going to care. The whole point, he's a 16-game player. He's not an 82-game player. He's a 16-game player, which is a term that I actually hate because it really should be a 16-win player, Yeah, yeah. not a 16-game player. But he's a player who is built for like, oh, you want to compete in the postseason? If he's healthy, that's your dude. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he's not healthy. And look, ultimately, you're going to have to rely on your training staff and you're going to have to rely on your medicals. And part of the advantage, by the way, of having him in-house is you already have this sort of relationship Mm -hmm. between him and and the medical team now to where you can be very comfortable on knowing everything Mm -hmm. going on with him. That being said, the Knicks' goals are not Starting next year, I'm telling you, like the Knicks' goals are not going to be this year. They wanted to get to 50 wins. They wanted mm-hmm. to get the two seed. Next year, if they're healthy and they do what they're supposed to do this summer and they bring back Ananobi and they find a way to keep Hartenstein and they're relatively healthy throughout the year, at least they shouldn't care about winning 52 versus 56 games. Mm-hmm. And I understand that's not how Tibbs operates, but mm-hmm. that's not really what I mean when I say care. If they're going to play the regular season as if every game is their last because right. it's a Tibbs that's team what and that's what they do. Yeah. But in terms of like their grand goals, their overriding goals from the front office, the front office should not care if they win 56 or 52 games. What the front office should be building at this point is they are good enough now as a team to where you need to be fine tuning what a playoff roster looks like. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a good argument that if the Knicks were healthy this year, you could say this is a really good playoff roster. Maybe don't make any major changes and run this thing back because this we think this roster is really good. I don't think that's crazy, but that would count as fine tuning for the playoffs, not necessarily for the regular season. And with Ananobi, he's a guy who can guard everybody. 
I, Tibbs has said it many times. He's a defense unto himself. When you have him on the court, like you said, 26 and five when he's there, the on offs are insane. They were a gazillion points better when he was on the court this year. It was absurd. I forget exactly where the number ended up, but it was something outrageous. It was like if it belonged to a player over the course of the season, it would have been number one in the league by far, mm. higher than Jokic in terms of the on offs and everything, not just defensively on both sides. It mm. was unbelievable. And you know that he works very well stylistically with Brunson works very well stylistically with Hartenstein, with DiVincenzo, with the rest of the guys that you have on your roster. It's just, if he's there and healthy come playoff time, ultimately, who cares if he's healthy in February? You'd love him to be healthy in February. But you just need him there for that one run, and all of a sudden, no one's going to care that he played 45 games because they're going to be like, look, at him helping lead this playoff performance and lead the Knicks to the conference finals or the finals or whatever else. 